for whole new urban planning models and just millions and millions of dollars in funding to support experts to build all new structures and a whole new infrastructure to support these urban farms. Our project, Window Farms, is about do-it-yourself food farming in New York City windows through crowdsourced research and development. We've set out to really create a craze for DIY vertical agriculture in existing apartment and office windows made by non-experts. The window farms are built with inexpensive, easily accessible materials through DIY experimentation processes. This is loud. <laughs> this little part, it's very short. Yes. Just plug your ears. Almost done. Where the plants are suspended in soilless medium and fed with liquid nutrients. The window farms are perpetuated by a network of individuals who conduct research and development and share their findings with the group. We've gathered a group of New Yorkers who are now building their own window farms all around the city. It's worldwide now. The point really isn't to create a one-size-fits-all product in the end, but instead to create a support network so that people are free to come up with unique designs and they also add to a knowledge base to help more people get involved. The knowledge base is online, it's very extensive. Most open source projects are online, and this is no exception. It's a worldwide project at this point. The intention of the project is to build a platform for crowdsourcing viral, small-scale innovation, creating opportunities for individuals to find and share new, cheap, quick, and really personal ways to solve environmental issues. Okay, I'm going to move to the next one. Yeah. So this is on the other end of the extreme in terms of the kinds of open source technology that people are working on and the ambitions that they have with it. Marchin, farmer, technologist. I was born in Poland, now in the U.S. I started a group called Open Source Ecology. We've identified the 50 most important machines that we think takes for modern life to exist. Things from tractors, bread ovens, circuit makers. Then we set out to create an open source, DIY, do-it-yourself version that anyone can build and maintain at a fraction of the cost. We call this the Global Village Construction Set. So let me tell you a story. So I finished my 20s with a PhD in fusion energy, and I discovered I was useless. <laughs> I had no practical skills. I mean, the world presented me with options, and I took them. I guess you can call it the consumer lifestyle. So I started a farm in Missouri and learned about the economics of farming. I bought a tractor, then it broke. I paid to get it repaired, then it broke again. <laughs> And pretty soon, I was broke too. I realized that the truly appropriate, low-cost tools that I needed to start a sustainable farm and settlement just didn't exist yet. I needed tools that were robust, modular, highly efficient and optimized, low-cost, made from local and recycled materials that would last a lifetime, not designed for obsolescence. I found that I would have to build them myself. So I did just that, and I tested them, and I found that industrial productivity can be achieved on a small scale. So then I published the 3D designs, schematics, instructional videos, and budgets on a wiki. Then contributors from all over the world began showing up, prototyping new machines during dedicated project visits. So far we have prototyped eight of the 50 machines, 
And now the project is beginning to grow on its own. We know that open source has succeeded with tools for managing knowledge and creativity, and the same is starting to happen with hardware too. We're focusing on hardware because it is hardware that can change people's lives in such tangible material ways. If we can lower the barriers to farming, building, manufacturing, then we can unleash just massive amounts of human potential. That's not only in the developing world. Our tools are being made for the American farmer, builder, entrepreneur, maker. We've seen lots of excitement from these people who can now start a construction business, parts manufacturing, organic CSA, or just selling power back to the grid. Our goal is a repository of published design so clear, so complete, that a single burned DVD is effectively a civilization starter kit. I've planted a hundred trees in a day. I've pressed 5,000 bricks in one day from the dirt beneath my feet and built a tractor in six days. From what I've seen, this is only the beginning. If this idea is truly sound, then the implications are significant. A greater distribution of the means of production, environmentally sound supply chains, and a newly relevant DIY maker culture can hope to transcend artificial scarcity. We're exploring the limits of what we all can do to make a better world with open hardware technology. Thank you. All right, any questions before we go on to our next and last presenter? Yes. How, how does uh, Arson's products uh, avoid being stolen by corporations? I think he licenses them, licenses, licenses them as Creative Commons, probably licensing. There's this wonderful way you can license products where you can allow anybody to use the intellectual property, but only on the condition that they allow other people to use it and they keep the source code open. It depends on you know the particular product you're talking about. But I would guess that would be how he does it. But it also, only in a competitive property society would you need to have that kind of protection, right? Right. I don't know why you have Right, right. <laughs> but for now, in the transition, I'm really excited about Creative Commons licensing. If you look up Creative, anything you create, um, the handout, that I that I gave you. If you look at if you go to um, Creative Commons, I think it's .org or whatever. You just Google that, and you can you can click get a, or do a license or something like that. And you can type in what you what conditions you want to put on. It can be like whatever. It can be anybody can use it for any reason as long as they share a like, and then they'll give you what to put on your on your paper or whatever it is. Yes, um, go ahead. I read a marvelous book years ago by Victor called Design for the Real World, yeah. where he designs things and gives them away. Ooh, cool. Patents, he says, patents are ridiculous. Yeah, totally. He just I keeps, just keeps every, everything, all these wonderful ideas from everyone. Yeah, that's so the thing. That's, that's the, 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 the citation about collaboration being so powerful. One of the reasons for that is we can build on each other's ideas. Right. With, with copyright and patent rules, we're we're so we're so limiting the potential of our technological development. It's it's amazing to think about. It's an issue of control. It's an issue of control and survival in this economy. And I want to talk later about. You do. Good. Well, we're going to interact. About money. Yes, money. Well, I mean, in this economy, we survive and thrive by being the ones that own the idea, right? But if our needs are met by default at a high level, there's no need to do that anymore. Our entire culture changes, our entire approach changes, innovation goes through the roof. So, any other, you had, a, somebody had a question. Yeah, is uh, Creative Commons, is that a repository where people can uh, post their ideas, publish their ideas? You know, I, I just recently started exploring the site. I've seen it, you'll, you've probably noticed on various things that it'll say licensing, instead of a little C copyright, it'll say Creative Commons, share alike or something. So, I think it may be also that. But it's it's a definitely a handy way to figure out what to put on your thing that you would like to license in that way. Also, the outgrowth of digital files like <coughs> pictures, like on Flickr.com, for example, people started 
using other people's pictures and stuff, and so they wanted to have a way to share it, but also get credit, at least. Right, right, right. Yeah, you can you can license it through the Creative Commons methods where you you, you know you're you're allowing others to use it as long as like you get credit and they are willing to let other people use it and and you and build upon it. So. And, and one of the key things is also like attributing it as like not you can't profit off. Right, that's one way. Yeah, you you one can thing, yeah. right. You actually can choose to have it be allowed to be used in commercial for commercial purposes, or you can select no, and they'll tell you what language to to use for that. So you can choose either one. Um, yeah, you can set all kinds of conditions. So any any other questions? Yeah. Uh, more more of a comment here is because of, in a lot of ways it's because of open source technology and open source programming. Uh, that a lot of these uh, issues with regards to these expensive programs that we have, but like in 3D programming and whatnot, in 3D modeling, you know, we have programs like 3ds Max, Houdini, they're like from anywhere between tens of thousands to twenty of thousands to thousands of dollars themselves really, but there's another program that, that, that has been built upon which is purely open source called Blender really, uh, go to blender.org, and it's completely free and it's just as powerful, it's just that the only only difference is, is that there it is that the uh, the, U the UI is very very different really, and it's and it's becoming rivaling uh, these 3D modeling really, and it's starting to over uh, it's starting to eclipse uh, these other th these other programs as well. So it's because of open source and things like Creative Commons and whatnot that are slowly starting to uh, to phase out this whole idea of market. And I think with these avenues, you know. In, in many ways, we can enter into a sort of post-market system or a semi-post-market if you want. Yeah, I mean, one of the ways people talk about it is making the monetary system obsolete. If we if we continue to participate, and these projects are going, even within the system, even with a little amount of spare time people have, there's so many open source projects. If you go to opensourceecology.org, I believe it is, it's not just the global construction set. He has every conceivable um, category of open source project you can think of and tons of links to different groups that are doing it like aquaponics and it just goes on and on so yeah and that surprising thing and I touched on it in the talk here in the slides but is I think what surprised many people is how much how much how, how high the quality is of these products it's, it's eclipsing I mean that graph Linux went way up to where it's it's operating most of the systems and it's an open source product so anyway any other questions because we do have one more presenter. Okay. Are you doing a on our presentation? Uh, we, we will be looking at them. Um, so please take some time and give us some feedback on what we could do better and you know what you're getting out of this. It, it really will help us. Um, we're going to be doing a lot more of this, hopefully. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Anthony. Uh, thank you Zeitgeist for inviting me to, to speak and share this presentation with all of you today. Um, I am from Sacramento and I'm currently uh, working with a group uh, called the Impulse Youth Group and we support uh, youth initiative. Um, as a legacy for the future we see that youth um, has the enthusiasm and the young at heart. We all, we all are young in our hearts if we can see uh, and perceive the world with enthusiasm and become engaged in the world with enthusiasm. Um, and what we're working on as a group, we, we host festival events uh, where we bring together um, elders in the community uh, and young people uh, we have this intergenerational convergence and we, we build relationships that's really important to all our endeavors is to build relationships. Warren spoke to this idea that we are one family uh, and without the friendships, without uh, the compassionate listening that we can hold space for one another, um, our educational environment or our action plans uh, will never have the kind of robust uh, foundation necessary to make these transitions. So seeing your faces 
is amazing and I hope to see them again at an event like this, maybe in Davis and perhaps in Sacramento. So uh, the other two things that I think are really important uh, is creating a healthy uh, and um, holistic learning environment so that we can uh, come to understanding together uh, of what our, what our goals are, what our vision is, uh, and um, like with the open source technology to start identifying those educational streams that can start, uh, that will allow us to do this now uh, and not depend on an outside source. We, these things can grow organically from within our own communities, within our own neighborhoods. Um, and so this can happen now. And the third aspect is to have very clear action-oriented projects. Um, these three things all uh, these three things all um, create a climate. Um, we have community relationships. Um, we have a strong learning environment, and we have clear uh, action-oriented projects. Uh, this creates a climate of transformation and change uh, that and transform our communities. Uh, so what, what I'm sharing today uh, is, is a project, is an action project uh, that has been incubated um, at a festival event that occurs in Sacramento uh, every third Sunday of the month. We meet at Southside Park. So if anyone's writing anything down, taking notes, maybe wants to hold on to some information and participate with us, This is a great place to meet up with like-minded individuals who are passionate about changing the world, being the change they want to see in the world. Uh, so the event is called We Renew. You can find it on Facebook. It's one word. Um, and we meet every third Sunday. So the project uh, that we have uh, begun to work on uh, is called Carrot Mob. Uh, Carrot Mob is an organization that started two years ago uh, in San Francisco. Um, a, a individual um, went out to 20-something liquor stores and he convinced these liquor stores uh, to bid a percentage of their profit from a coordinated buy day uh, that would go towards sustainable retrofitting of uh, um, energy devices, refrigerators, uh, heaters, and light bulbs. Um, and so what he did is he, he came into an agreement, he came into a contract agreement with the business and said, okay, if I can organize a few hundred people to come buy from your store on this particular day, what percentage of profit are you willing to bid, bid forth that will be allocated towards this sustainable move. And so we'll, we'll bring in experts and they'll create this change in your store uh, following that. So we wanna, we wanna do that here in Sacramento. We're working on identifying a, a business here in Sacramento and one in Davis. Um, but we, have, we wanna do something a little, a little different uh, and what I find to be a little more poignant to our time. Uh, and that is to localize food production and the way we want to go about doing that is to utilize an incredible uh, an incredibly valuable space that goes unrecognized because we never see it uh, and that's rooftops flat rooftops especially from businesses they get beat upon especially by the Sacramento Sun or this area um, and this and this energy source can grow plants and it can, you can source energy, solar panels. Uh, and so what we'd like to do is, um, we've identified some businesses and uh, we of course, if there's anyone who wants a feedback with us on this, you can check us out at, uh, you can email the group at the we renew impulse at gmail.com. So 
we're talking about transitioning into a resource-based economy, uh, eliminating the competitive market based upon profits, short-term gains, and for the profit of uh, few. Instead, we want to meet. We want to meet our. Uh, the place to meet our needs is right here. Is recognizing the resources we have in our community, and coordinating ways to um, uh, to bring about yes this meeting of needs. Uh, and so, what we propose to do is to go to these businesses uh, in Sacramento and Davis. So, if there's any, especially local um, local grocery stores, cafes, uh, smoothie places, anywhere where they're 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 providing food to people. Also, the, the a possibility of convincing someone to source their energy from solar panels. So, what we would do is have, we would select a number of businesses, let's say 12 businesses, and we would say, yes, let's arrive at this agreement, we want to create this change, will you participate how much of your percentage, how much percentage of your profit on this coordinated by day that we will, as a community, organize as a network, will come in on this one day and create this large influx of profit for this business that will then uh, be applied to this uh, sustainable localizing food production or energy sourcing. So we have the technology, uh, we have uh, a company that is very interested uh, in providing um, hydroponic systems for these rooftop gardens uh, and we're still on the search for uh, local solar energy um, installers uh, and so we want to go both those routes. Um, ultimately this ultimately this is uh, this isn't any sort of end game maneuver this isn't some uh, ultimate practical application because essentially it's still it's still participating in a market economy um, and it, it's so it's limited it is limited uh, we we do have the power as consumers to to change what is being produced for us. We can encourage the production to take place at a more localized level. That thus eliminating fossil fuel use for transportation and energy sourcing uh, on the conventional grid. Uh, and there, and we can grow our energy right here through the use of solar panels, wind turbines, and so forth. Uh, each step that we can uh, with each step that we take, um, the long-term vision is to redefine the conversation in community about where our resources are coming from. How we can develop ways and methods uh, that they can develop right here at home. Uh, and so I think this becomes this project, the Carrot Mob project. You can look up Carrot Mob, carrotmob.com. So this is, this is one step in, a, in an ongoing transformation uh, and, um, and hopefully a deepening conversation within our community uh, that we can create these self-sufficient uh, nexuses um, and provide ultimately for one another uh, through abundance. Just creating this, uh, this abundance, maybe this could catch like wildfire, and every business is like, me next, me next, me next. And then before you know it, a city like Sacramento could be sourcing all of its food um, right on its rooftops, sourcing large amounts of energy through solar panels. Uh, and we can achieve that just with our enthusiasm. We can just go into these places just with our enthusiasm and with the support of our communities, create the change in these businesses. Now what the hope is, is that so much abundance is created here at these businesses, people start recognizing, hey, well maybe it would be a good venture for my school to put these, uh, to put these systems in. Uh, maybe this would be a good place, uh, I, now that there's so much information being generated, maybe I could do this at home because there's so many people that know how to do this. I could ask a couple of friends and, and I can provide food right here for my own family. I don't have to go to those businesses anymore. Um, 
And so that's, that's the long-term vision, I, and I hope that we can start seeing something like that. Um, so yes, please check out carrotmob.com. Uh, there are currently uh, two dozen projects happening throughout the world. It's, uh, it's becoming um, quite the movement. Uh, once we identify the business that we'll be working with, one in Sacramento, one in Davis, Carrot Mob as an organization will help uh, the networking um, and advertising um, and getting the word out here in Sacramento. They have a very extensive network. Uh, and actually there are a lot of people who are interested in doing this in Sacramento already. So here's our project. Um, yeah, so the technology that we'll, we'll be incorporating, keep in mind, uh, is hydroponics. And, uh, and that's each person is just contributing a little bit. Maybe it's a restaurant, maybe it's a store buying a little something uh, and creating this great swell uh, that can then go into buying um, uh, these technologies. Uh, one other thing I want to mention, so we, uh, we're always, uh, before I mention this, um, yeah, so please contact us. I would love, you know, any anyone to participate. This is completely open. Um, we Renew is a free event. Uh, this coming Sunday, it's the 20th, uh, we'll be in Southside Park. Uh, and for the, our, this will be our, our fourth, um, our fourth event. And this time we'll be featuring a gift circle, uh, which is really great, which is really cool. Um, if you don't know, if you haven't heard about what a gift circle is, uh, essentially uh, a group of people will come together and we'll just freely speak first what our needs are. It, it might be simple as food. Maybe someone needs food in our group. Um, it, it could be someone needs a bicycle because that's the that's the transportation that they could really rely on. Um, and then in the next portion of the session, we'll freely express what we have in excess. So at the last gift circle I went to, I said, I need a bike. There's a lot. There's a lot of transportation needs that I could accomplish with the bike. And I want to get I want to get off the fossil fuel grid as fast as possible, um, not only for the environment but for fun and <laughs> exercise and just being out in the world. And someone and lo and behold, there was someone in the group I wouldn't have known it because this without this gift circle that conversation wouldn't have happened. He said, "I have five bikes. I have five bikes. This is something I like to tinker with. I have this this excess." And boom, there was that connection was made, and it happens freely. So that's what we're hoping to achieve. We're going to be hosting this gift circle, so I, I welcome you to come and participate in that. Um, uh, the other, I, I would like to give two shout outs um, to some, some really inspiring, uh, uh, inspiring individuals who uh, have these very, very small books. They're like this, this thing. You can read them in maybe a day or two. Um, one is called Renewing the Social Organism. And this is written by um, turn of the century Austrian writer by the name of Rudolf Steiner. And there's one more contemporary text uh, that riffs off this, which I'll, I'll just touch on in a, uh, in a second, and this is called Functional Threefoldness of the Human Organism. Great choice of an author with, with Rudolf Steiner, by the way. <laughs> What's that? Great choice of an author with Rudolf Steiner. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's incredible. <laughs> Um, yes. oh, I don't have the uh, <laughs> the author's name for uh, for this text here, but you search it on Google, you'll find it. Oh no, I do. Uh, Johannes Rowan. Okay. Now, with a simple, very simple diagram, I can touch on in in 30 seconds what is being explored, what ideas are being explored by these two individuals. So the threefold social order uh, is seeing three essential uh, aspects 
of our social organism. Uh, one is our civil life, our law. One is our cultural institutions, education, health care. And our, um, yeah, even in our religious institutions as well would be incorporated into that. Um, and the economic sphere. They have, they have identified three essential core qualities about each of these institutions. Our institutions of law, our government, our cultural institutions, and our economic institutions. They posit that in order to have, in order to function harmoniously, these three spheres need to become increasingly independent. Now, but they, they operate under guiding principles. Right now, what we see is an economic sphere because it's hinging on our existential reality, right? We need food. The, uh, the economy is based on needs. We need food. So what's happening is that our cultural and civil institutions are becoming merged with the economic sphere. And this, this is leading to all these twists, twists and perversions of our lives. Our, our education system becoming uh, standardized uh, and, and not free. Um, like SOL testing, uh, SATs, these people, uh, teachers having to teach to the books and not to the human spirit and not to the unfoldment of everyone's unique capacities, right? And civil, right? We all know that there is an unhealthy relationship happening here with the bailing out of the banks. So what they put forth, I'll finish up in just a second here, is that there are three guiding principles for each of these spheres. Civil is equality, simple. Sometimes this gets confused, we think, oh, well, civil is about uh, our civil life, our life under law is about freedom. We, this, this protects our freedom, right? We must be seen equal under the law so that we can freely go about our religious, our educational, and our healthcare life, right? So this cultural is defined by freedom. Now, like economics. Right now, there's this unhealthy, uh, this is an unhealthy, you could say that this overlap is merging, and so, yeah, we're free to do what we want. It's based on profit, this capitalistic, the individualistic outlook. But really, what he says we really need here, and what's being talked about right here, is brotherhood. An economy based on brotherhood. Now, this could all seem very theoretical, and I, sure it is, but I encourage you to read these books, and you'll get a more pragmatic uh, perspective on what this may look like if we actually go about um, creating this greater independence between these spheres. So, that is my presentation. I hope you'll join us in our Carrot Mop project. At the, by the end of May, we'll, ha we'll have identified the businesses that we're gonna work with, uh, and in the summer, we'll hopefully see these rooftop gardens go up and sourcing some solar energy. Um, yeah, and come join us on the third Sunday of every month for We Renew. And check out these amazing texts that are about this thing. Okay, so does anyone have any questions? Oh, you're awesome. Really silly. What? Why isn't it more of a Venn diagram, like a three-way Venn diagram? <laughs> since Sorry. since the uh, the opposite end, this is really silly, but uh, I, know, I think yeah, I think I see what you're saying. Yeah, just cause since the economic and the law are overlapped as well, I, I was curious. Maybe something <laughs> like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That that would that would do well. Yeah. Right on. Just check it. So yeah, there are obviously some convergences there. Yes, that would be the more appropriate diagram.
Yeah. Do you guys ever have any um, do-it-yourself uh, hydroponic workshop? We haven't we haven't hosted that yet. But that's a great suggestion. It's a really wonderful suggestion. We actually have someone in the group who helped to found this, who is uh, just a, a leader. He's so passionate about aquaponics and he has a lot to share on it. So thank you for that. Really? Great. Um, yeah, so please, if you, uh, if you can send an email here to the We Renew Impulse, then we'll get you on board. Yeah, earlier in the talk, someone mentioned that following the disaster of Fukushima, nuclear plants are being shut down in Japan, Germany, France. Is there some kind of correlation between the rate of the occurrence of disaster and the rate of the kind of changes that you advocate? So, okay, so that, did everyone hear that? No, I didn't, I didn't. Okay, so do the does the acceleration of natural disasters have something to do with the acceleration of change? change. Is, is this what we're talking about? Nothing's going to happen until there's a disaster. Right. Mm -hmm. is, is this what's going to happen and what's going to do? You mind if I chime in on yeah. that? Uh, that particular one, I, I actually don't believe France is shutting down its nuclear power. I think that yeah, was... Yeah, I'm not sure if I got Yeah, that. France... No, 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 somebody did say that earlier, and I don't think that's accurate. Japan is, is entering into a natural gas arrangement with Russia, and they're shutting down all of their nuclear power plants <coughs> as soon as possible. Um, Japan's doing that for obvious reasons. Their economy is in collapse. The Hokkaido, the region where the plant went down, has no power. I mean, it's just, they get it, okay? There's nothing like a nuclear disaster in your country to wake you up to the problems. We had the same thing at Three Mile Island. Just a few, you know, about 20 miles from here, back in the 70s, we have a nuclear power plant uh, called Rancho Seco. There was nothing wrong with it, but after Three Mile Island, you know, there was an initiative in Sacramento, shut it down. So that type of thing happens when there's an awareness building. To my knowledge, the only place where there's a direct, immediate shutdown is Japan, and it's related to the incident. There may be some interest in Europe to moving off of nuclear. We're seeing the exact opposite here. You're seeing uh, all of the uh, cheerleaders, I would say, come out of the woodwork trying to champion more nuclear power plants. China right now is actually on an aggressive uh, footing to, to build hundreds of them over the next 10 to 20 years. So you, I wouldn't say there's by any means a uh, uniform reaction to these uh, disasters, but I think it's certainly something that advocates of change can point to and say, you know, it's necessary that we do this ultimately because that one plant, you can de you can find detectable amounts of radiation on every cubic centimeter of this planet as a result of that particular incident that happened in Japan. How many more of those things do we need to have happen before we wake up and realize that this is not a sustainable way of moving forward? We're going to move into question and answers after this. Um, we've got a, a musical closing, if you will, to the first part of the production, and then we've got this room for hours. No, no. Hours? No. no. Minutes? We have the room until uh, 1245, so we can, we can do so our we can do more, more interaction stuff. We got started late, so. <laughs> Did you want to talk for a second, real quick, or? I gotta see if my, can you hear that pretty well? Yep. So this is a quick, simple song that I wrote actually for this event, so hopefully I'll remember all the words. If you feel like it, you can sing. Pretty, pretty easy. When we talk about world change, we don't have to agree, but maybe I can learn from you and you can learn from me so that one day at a time, step by step, we can climb and we can find our way to a brand new day. Knowledge is emergent, that's what they say, so let's learn something new each and every day so that one day at a time, step by step, we can climb. And we can find our way to that brand new day. And if we search with open minds, we might 
See the same signs and so Choose the same paths more and more of the time So that one day it's time, step by step, we can climb And we can find our way to that brand new day And maybe if we try to be the change we want to see and help Others do that too, why? We can make it through so that one day at a time, step by step, we can play and we can find our way to that brand new day. And maybe for a peaceful transition, we might avoid judgment and look for a solution for the one hundred percent so that one day at a time step by step we can find and we can find our way to that brand new day now that's first it may seem too hard even hopeless at times Together we're unstoppable, another world is possible, so one day at a time, step by step, let us climb, so we can find our way to that brand new day, step. one day at a time, step by step, let us climb, so we can find our way to that brand new day. I don't know how we want to do this. We don't really have chairs to get in the circle. Warren, do you have a, an idea of how to do this? Thank you everyone for coming. Um, I guess we're about to wrap up and open up to questions and answers. Um, but both, can everyone hear me? Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay, so now, uh, right before we open up the Q&As though, I just uh, wanted to say something. You know, uh, today, we t today we touched upon Today we made a case together, I think, in our dialogue together that there's a need for change. And we've talked about transitions, about how we could go about that transition. We talked about projects we could do in the now, and such as with Care Mob, and how we can start to begin to localize food production, and start beginning to create safety nets to start moving towards that. And what I realized watching the event in the presentation today, I realized that this is part of the transition. From the beginning to the end, we've come together today to move in the process together. So, I just want to say thank you. And so, does anyone have any questions that they want to ask any of the members or? Just feedback. Can you give feedback on what we just talked about? Yeah. What do you guys? What do you guys? What, what do you guys think of? Do, do you guys think we need a change? Yes. Are, are we sure about that? This is <laughs> us living in an alternate reality. Like, okay. James. You know, there's, there's so much I want to talk about. It's unbelievable. Oh, we'll we'll be out there. We got this room to 12:45, but we got all day. You know, with the festival and whatnot to talk. So, uh, what 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 was your question or comment? I I want. I'm trying to really narrow it down so that um, I want to talk about, to me, one of the most important things that I learned about indirectly. Um, so this change to really come about, um, let me ask a simple question first. Come on down, my chief. Yeah, why don't you use the microphone? <laughs> It's hard to hear. Okay, it's okay. Thanks. I'm James. Uh, I have been involved personally just pondering this material for years now. And as I connected with people at the booth yesterday, 
And as they were talking, I'm saying, you're reading my mind. You know, but we have the ability. We have the resources right within us. Okay, now, one of the most important things I learned was look at what we've done with our brains to now. We've only tapped the 10% of that capability. And this was, uh, I listened to an interview by Joseph Chilton Pierce. I don't know if anybody knows about him, but it's remarkable. He says, look, we've done all this stuff, all this technology with just 10% of our brains. But he had a remarkable experience because what's really needed, it needed now is a, is a spiritual revolution. This is really key. I mean, who are we? You know, we are much more than our bodies, much more than our brains, much more than our emotions. Okay? It comes from, I mean, and Taoism talks about it in a very strange way. The Tao is the great mystery. It's way beyond our meager brains to comprehend what this is all about. But the creative process comes from that source. How do we get into that source? How many people here, I'm not selling this material by the way, mm -hmm. meditate? That's amazing, that's great, because what happens is when you meditate, you move out of the limitations of your brain. Your brain can only do so much, okay? But this is where the real creativity happens. Joseph Chilton Pierce's experience, really, in this interview on the radio, this was years ago, but he said, he was the author of several books about the way children learn, The Crack and the Cosmic Egg, The Magical Child, The Magical Child Matures, a whole series of books, okay? This man, he, he studied the brain and how things worked. And he was giving you know, lectures and talks and everything and had all these workshops and everything. But he had a remarkable experience. Someone read his book, one of his books, sent him a letter and said, Joseph, this is really great stuff. But you need to go see my guru. And he didn't realize that he had the worst case of anti-guru-itis ever. And he was, felt as if he was tossed from one end of the universe to the other end of the universe in his response. He was so like, how can anybody say that to me? I've done so much work. But the brilliance of this man was his, his humility in recognizing that he was literally thrown across the universe. And he said to his support staff, look, I want you to take over the rest of these workshops. I have to go, I have to leave. And he left all that work and he spent five years with that guru in India. And he learned how to meditate. And he learned about who he was. He had no idea. And he said, what came out of this was, there was a time when he, I mean, he was, this was guy who was a PhD, okay? He's a learned person. He wrote books. Uh, he said, but there were some, there were books that he just couldn't read. It was too technical. When he, after the five years was up, his master said, the guru said to him, Joseph, we do not, do our work in caves. You know, you, you've learned all this stuff. And send them back to exactly what it was doing before. But its outlook was changed, totally changed. What he, he said now, he can just open up any book and absorb the material. He said, what happened? And what he realized what happened was that when he got in touch with his heart intelligence, the intelligence of his heart, his brain worked in, our brains work in service to the higher intelligence. It automatically ramps up. So the brain's capabilities increase dramatically once we get in touch with our heart intelligence. Now it's not just on a physical location, okay. It, it, it's, 
I mean, in several different traditions, like in, in, in Taoism, it's the center of your being, it's in the Dantian. You know, it's the center of your being, you know. It's, it's, it's a non-physical reality. This is who we really are. I mean, it's really strange when you understand that the physicists these days actually recognize the, stru in the structure of the atoms and the molecules. In terms of matter, there's hardly anything. We are mostly space. <laughs> what does so, that mean? So I think, I think what you're saying is that I really liked how you touched on spiritual. Yeah, that's where the revolution has to happen. Because as we make these decisions, where are we coming from? Yes. Are we coming from our brains? Or are we coming from our hearts? If we're coming from our hearts, we'll make some really good decisions. Okay. That's, Money? That's actually really interesting. I actually wanted to yeah. talk about that for a second. Which was, I'm really glad you brought up no, the spiritual awakening or whatnot, because I think that's a very important point that we must remember is that in order to change, like look at Howard Festival. We're here at this wonderful festival with wonderful people and we're essentially making this a culture. We're, we're making sustainability, we're making community bonding a norm just by us being here right now together. And so what we need is a paradigm shift, a cultural shift. And so I'm really glad you made that point. And yeah. Let me see one more thing. And, and when I learned about paradigms, paradigms years ago, the thought occurred to me. You know, if you, if you sit and ponder things, like in meditation, you got a question, just sit, be quiet, and wait, and you'll get amazing answers because we're all a part of the universe. It's inherent in us, but we have to shut our brains down. We have to move from our ego, survival, reality, mindset, operating out of fear, and that, that's gonna get us in trouble. It's already, that's what this whole thing is about. We're operating out of fear. You know, but we, we need to move in, into a different space so that we can actually start to touch and tap into our deeper wisdom. We all have this. Other people know. Yeah. yeah. Oh, we all have this. Can I chime in real quick, Alan? Sure, sure. So I think that we do all have this basic wisdom. And I think we know inherently that the things that we've been talking about today in terms of the problems with the planet, the question from the gentleman over here in terms of what's happening with radioactive waste and so forth. We could literally fill this chalkboard <laughs> with a point font with all the problems that, they, that exist. And I think what I'd like to suggest is that we bring it back down to where, where we started today. And I'd like to ask the question, I'm not even on the agenda today, but I am a Zeitgeist member. Um, I'm curious, I, I think we did this at the beginning, how many people in the room have seen any of the Zeitgeist films, know what Zeitgeist is about? Okay, so I'm kind of preaching to the choir, but I'd like to kind of talk to this side of the room. Um, Zeitgeist posits that, you know, you've got some overarching problems with society, okay? We've talked on the environmental sustainability. We've talked about food distribution. All of those things uh, come back to a monetary paradigm, uh, the use of energy, inequality, and so forth. These are all buzzwords, but what it amounts to is that this country, 300 million of us, uses something like 40% of the Earth's resources. When you have, I think we're up to 7 billion people now on the planet, there are literally people dying about every few seconds before I'm finished talking. You know, probably a dozen people will have died on the African continent. And right now, we're, we're using something like half of the arable land in this country to grow corn. The risk is, I think, that you get a good idea that comes from the heart, the whole Earth Festival. I'm not knocking anybody out here, but I think the whole Earth Festival, the original concept of it was to identify what we all know in our hearts, which is the Earth is in trouble. What has it turned into? I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I'm going to be out here buying my uh, mom her Mother's Day present. Why? Because I know that's what's out there. You have some speakers and so forth, but we are basically fairly simple animals. Um, we haven't changed at all, and yet look what's happened.
to the planet in the last hundred years. We're the same fancy monkey, if you will. Um, and each of us spends a huge amount of our time trying to extract enough material possessions and food out of this system that has been created for our control to survive. And we can't stop fighting for our survival because of the monetary paradigm that exists. We're all going to leave here and say, I, I know me, the majority of my time next week, every waking moment is going to be trying to extract enough money out of the system to feed these two boys, put a roof over my family's head, and I am so far in debt, I'll never be out of debt probably before the day I die. That's probably true for most of you. My wife over here went to UC Davis. We're still paying off the debts of the educational system, and it's much worse now. And you know, I think the thing that really got me about the Zeitgeist movement, and if there's, I, here I am, I am on my, just imagine me and my hands and knees pleading with you and every other human on this planet to watch the Zeitgeist films, because I think what woke me up was about the monetary paradigm. There's some things that I would like to just say, and I'm sure others would like to chime in on this point. I think that that is something that everybody needs to know. I think you all need to know what fiat currency is. I think you need to know that the dollars in my wallet right here are based on nothing other than your belief, my belief, and the common belief that there's value to them. They're not based on anything. They don't represent gold. They don't represent silver. They can be tripled, doubled, quadrupled at any time by the Federal Reserve, which is not a governmental entity. It's a private bank owned by the Rockefellers and Morgans. You know, we talk about the bank bailout, and wow, maybe that was some kind of unusual thing that maybe we shouldn't have done it. That's what the Federal Reserve System was created for in 1913. They knew then that this situation would eventually happen because you can't operate a monetary system based on perpetual growth indefinitely on a finite planet. You will eventually, it doesn't matter, I mean economists were talking about it before the creation of the Federal Reserve in the, in the 1890s. And yet we went about it, Federal Reserve Act was, was passed while the majority of Congress was on Christmas break. Uh, at the same time, guess what else was created? The IRS. So you have a national bank, the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve looks like, you know, it's a white building with columns, kind of looks like, I don't know, the Capitol, maybe. Federal Reserve on it, implication is this is some kind of official governmental entity that theoretically we have some control over. BS. That is a private entity. These notes are Federal Reserve notes. They are from a private bank. And the Treasury backs these with your, the ability to tax you. That was a creation of the Internal Revenue Service that was done at the same time that the Federal Reserve was created. So, is that a problem necessarily? Maybe not. The problem is, as I see it, is the system is at the very end of its paradigm. We are at the point of utter collapse. And it's not just the United States, it's every other fiat currency, and they're basically all fiat currencies at this point. It started back in 1913. These were backed, individual dollars and coins were backed by silver. It was held in reserve by the federal government and all other dollars were backed 100% by gold originally. Then after World War II, it went down to 40%. And then 1971, Nixon took us off the gold standard altogether. So these are literally worthless. There's only reason that these dollars are worth anything is because we agreed to give them value. And yet we exchange our life energy for these dollars. I don't know about you, but I'm going to spend, like I said, 40, 50, 60, 70 hours next week so that somebody will give me these. Funny money. It doesn't have, that, I'll prove to you there's no value to them. Somebody was mentioning the fact that uh, during the collapse in October of 2008, the federal government just out of thin air, manufactured trillions of dollars. How did they do that? They obligated the taxpayers to pay for the creation of extra currency so that the debt could be paid off to sustain the banks. That is what the Federal, read the Federal Reserve Act. That is why that was there. That's the whole concept of too big to fail. 
Anybody notice that none of the banks have been broken up into smaller banks? Every single bank is actually larger now than before in 2008. It's by design. The bankers control the system. We are in a new form of slavery. We are, unlike the South, you know, in the, found, the founding days of, of our country, where you had physical slavery, people physically controlled. At that time, slaves were kept, fed, housed, health care, so forth by the slave owner. At this point, we have to feed, house ourselves. By it, it, it's, it's a perfect system, and yet, I don't know about you, but I don't own my house. I have the, I say I own it, but I'm paying a mortgage on it, and something like 95% of that wealth that I pay, my life energy, is interest that goes to the banks. They didn't. Even, they printed the money out of thin air. There's not. It's not based on any gold reserve that they have. And uh, same thing. All the energy, all the food, all of it is profit for some multinational corporation or, or ultimately a bank. And it's it's a system that is fraught with waste. Jobs are made out of thin air, just for the purpose of the monetary system. If we could somehow have a massive paradigm shift. Everybody all at once, wake up. That's what Zeitgeist is about. It's waking people up. I use the analogy, if any of you saw Matrix, red pill, blue pill. Right. You know, uh, take the red pill. That's what the Zeitgeist movement is about. It's about a paradigm shift. That we don't have to do it this way. Does anybody doubt that every single person on the planet could be provided with an iPhone in 60 or 90 days if we really wanted to do it? Does anybody doubt that? Does anybody doubt that we could go to the moon or Mars or fill in the blank? Do you know how that actually happened, how that happens in this paradigm? It's you take care of everybody's needs. Think about what NASA represents. Think about what the, uh, you know, the, you get everybody's needs met, put them all into a think tank type environment, provide them with food 24-7, all their needs are completely met, give them a goal. Okay, we're gonna go to the moon. We'll do it. And yeah, I'm, come on up, anybody else who wants no. to chime in? Yeah. Oh, or I don't even know what time, what time it is. Okay, so uh, we're about to uh, close down right now. Uh, does anyone have any quick, short questions right now? Okay, uh, we'll be coming. Uh, we'll be outside. So feel free to just hang out with us. Okay. Uh, we'll be outside. I got a quick remark. Well, we, we got we we to go. We got to go. We got to go. We can talk right outside. We can talk right outside. We'd love to.